Okay, <coughs> thank you. Welcome. Thanks for choosing this uh, talk. This is basically uh, the talk version of a training that I did yesterday. So we're going to work pretty fast, and I just want to give you a grasp about working with just special analysis with Python. Okay, the talk yesterday, the training yesterday was pretty interesting because we see in the first part, an introductory part about just special in general, and in particular, we see concept about vector uh, raster satellite imagery how okay, can uh, we change uh, uh, projection and things like latitude longitude okay we're gonna skip all these parts and try to go deeper while we go through the code itself naturally you find my code over github i say to put the some instruction about pulling a docker a docker image from docker Hub because the all this code and the sample data and the output itself will be we is actually embedded in the Docker image itself. So you run the image itself, you run the code, and you get out the data itself. So first part of this training is all about the vectors, basically. Vectors is the equivalent in a signal processing field of a discrete, uh, a discrete time source, for example, in this case, where you have basically a finite set of uh, features, which are being characterized by two different types. Okay, a geometry, which can be a polygon, a point, a line, a multi-line, or something complex geometry, and a set of attributes that somehow are related to the geometry itself. The uh, One of the most famous uh, vector source for geo-handling geospatial data is, by, is called uh, Shapefile. Shapefile basically is some sort of database database basically it contains uh, some information about the geometry and a set of attributes and obviously there is a library which is called geopandas which is basically pandas plus geospatial capabilities okay and so in order to read the file you just need to call the api read file and you get up with the classic pandas output which is a data frame where you have basically one column more which is actually the geometry you see that the shape file that you find on the docker image is basically a point base so it contains just points a lot of points with some attributes which in this case is with the m1 m2 m3 m4 Obviously, you can run any kind of PANAS method you already know, like getting a summary. You get here to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, things like this. You can just apply some sort of sampling method to extract sampling from the source itself. You can calculate and adding new columns based on previous values exactly as the same as GeoPies at PANDAS data frame. And you obviously try to plot them out the data frame. Actually, this kind of representation that does not have many much sense because this, we don't know actually where these points are located. These are geographical entities, so they are somewhere in the earth. What we're basically going to see in the future how to try to map them on a flat surface and, and the earth as a base map. Okay, obviously, another format that you probably know is called GeoJSON. GeoJSON is a JSON with geo capabilities. So using a JSON, which is pretty cool standard for interchanging data between client and server, you add some geographical features. And obviously, GeoPandas let you load your JSON, save to GeoJSON, as long as obviously saving to shapefile, which is the same format that we see we saw earlier in the presentation. And there we go. We can use this uh, library, which is course volume, which is, works pretty well with Jupyter Notebooks that lets you play with maps. In particular, we're going to play with these maps centered around these coordinates, which is the latitude and longitude at the zoom start level. And we're going to play, we're going to try to plot the data out, OK, on this map. So this is basically the same graph that we see earlier, but you know that this point are located on a particular zone of Italy. Actually, these points are the sample points of the original data frame, not the entire data frame. I should warn you that volume, and in particular, this kind of libraries are not able to handle a lots and lots of points. There are other technologies that we're going to not see during this training capable of showing really amounts of data. This is just for experiencing and try to understand or get a grasp about the distribution of data you know, of our data. Obviously, you can uh, draw uh, also GeoJSON, like this one. As you see, you got uh, something, a feature that, which uh, 
um, which geometry is different because in this case you got a polygon, while in the other case, in the previous one, you got a series of points, but it's actually the same. They change the shape, but the idea is actually the same. You can use other libraries to plot data, such as things like Bouquet, which was very good because it offers you interactive tools to interact with data itself. So you basically have system like panning or I don't know, system like uh, zooming in. Also in this case, this uh, chart has not much sense because you have no base layer map where these points are located. And you can obviously load some GeoJSON and try to show them on different layer on the base map itself. This is Bari, a city on the sun in Italy. And you'll find there that I just loaded two different GeoJSON files which contain geographical entities. And you end up basically with a base map in the two different layer, platform and parking. You, should, you can basically disable one or enable one based on what you're gonna see. Obviously, you can, since you're just playing with tabular data in general, you could run any kind of operation that typically comes from the table background, union, intersection, uh, difference, things like this. For example, clipping data is typically done and uh, typically explainable, self-explainable with these features. And in particular, we're gonna filter out using the within method the points that the, that intersect the clipped area called via adjudication. And the result is pretty obvious. You got here a series of points that intersect the area and the red points that are not intersecting. Okay, it's pretty easy. Obviously, volumes give you the ability to generate a map that highlights the density of the points on a particular zone. So you get end up with things like this. You have the ability to clustering points because you start seeing too many points and you start playing with, let's say, uh, aggregating them somehow by geometry, for example, and you start zooming in and the, po the points itself are start exploding and the cluster becomes much, much, much smaller. Okay, and you can start introducing something more, let's say, more interesting or more difficult to, I don't know, more, more enjoyable, let's put it this way. Okay, for example, defining this kind of fishnet, which is basically a grid, okay? And you start putting those points on over, over and over a grid, and in particular, you can apply some sort of mechanism or a simple algorithm to color a grid background or set a grid background based on some feature that belongs to the point itself. So you count, for example, how many points intersect to a cell background, they assign a color to that cell background. You can do this by really a few line of code using things like Matplotlib, um, Pandas itself and this volume for the visualization part and things are pretty easy. The uh, the the final result is not so it's not so appealing, but I know but basically it reflects our idea that uh, where are many points the color is quite different based on the very scale, which is a color map that uh, whose color has been chosen by a number of points that intersect from that kind of data. Okay, this is vectors. So vectors discrete. Time, uh, discrete source in general, geographic source. Working with rasters. Rasters are basically photos took by your photo camera, things like this. Okay, so nothing complex. Okay, you'll end up playing with, in this case, another library which is called Raster.io, which handles obviously the raster. And in particular, you're gonna usually think like, uh, get things like this. Because in general, when you start playing with images, you got different bands. Bands means that you got basically different channel of the same image, so an image is composed by a stack of metrics, okay? You get up with a colored image, just stacking them all together and combining them in the red channel, in the blue channel, and the green channel. And you get up with the, the typical image that you get used to see, just combining all this information. In particular, this one, using a color map of red, you see basically a Part of the a part of the Earth. This image is real, obviously. The this dark part is basically uh, like well, this one I see this. Obviously, you could apply the same, basically the same concept to the old bands and start playing and plotting, imaging in different channels. And at the end, combining all of them using just an MPI D stack option, you end up with the classic colored image where you are basically able to understand this is a lake, this is a city, and so on. Since we're playing with computer vision, basically to explore these kind of things, you could apply some equalized algorithm 
where you basically don't are not changing the format of the original image, but changing the way the image itself has been displayed. And so in this way, you want to light, for example, the values which are concentrated between three and 90 cent percentile, okay? It's pretty easy. And in this way, you basically highlight some feature that you probably are not see in the original image itself. In general, so we could say that basically an image is composed by different bands, okay? As we see later in the future of well, what we're talking about satellite imagery, you got different bands and you want to combine them or transform a multi-band image into one band image or multiple band, one band image. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. So you basically have a way with raster your to extract this kind of information, like in this case, where you have the band one, which is U int eight. So basically, are you going to use hint sampled with eight bits? So you got a 250, 50, 55, sorry, 55 value as maximum. And the band zero can be interpreted as a red channel, the band one as a yeah, green one, yeah, so on, etc. And you get some uh, basically uh, detail about the width, about the eight, about the numbers of bands that are compressed in here. And you can obviously pass and transform from a multi-band geotiff, which contains typically uh, three different channels to one using just these few lines of codes, and you verify that you basically have some band that is obviously interpreted as a grayscale. In general, grayscale, but you can apply any color map you want to use red colors, for example, blue colors, or something that spans from red, red to blue, anywhere you want. Obviously, you could apply some sort of random transformation, so you can basically transform and multiply each pixel of the image by random quantity, you get out the result itself, which is uh, one. I say that this, uh, this directory that I hear in the image contains all the data, so you basically go over here, you can see and check the result itself. And you can start trying to resampling the image itself. So you got an image which is bigger, you want to reduce the size, you can apply some sort of transformation, which is in this case a linear transformation, okay? And you basically use, in this case, array again, this raster yo. Obviously, with geographical data in general, things are pretty much complicated and much more complicated than in general because you don't want to lose your special information, in particular, geo reference information about the entities that are found in the image itself. So you're gonna play attention with this one, and in particular in the uh, geo, geospatial field, there is a concept that is resampling and a series of resampling, like this one, the bilinear, which is an algorithm that try to maintain the exact correspondence between the scaled image and the original one, just to make sure that the image appears the same, and points in terms of latitude, longitude, and altitude in the same, in the, in in the final result is the same. It's quite important because I was talking about the special information. If you got an image, no one cares about this. Uh, what else? What else is basically the same? You basically end up saving the downsampled version of the band one resize image. And obviously you can change projection. Uh, we, say, we saw earlier that basically you need the pretty known system, coordinate system reference, which is based on latitude, longitude, and altitude, but it's not the sole one. It's probably the most common, but it is referred to our Earth, which is a globe, which is a geoid, actually. And we're gonna try to understand how can we transform this kind of information to a flat surface. This is pretty interesting question, and in, from a really science point of view, this is pretty recent as uh, innovation. So you got basically different kind of transformation and closed math formulas that let you transform from geodetic system, which is the first one based on altitude, longitude, and altitude, to something to something different. So basically, Raster EO offers you the ability to map and apply this kind of transformation almost for free. You can know, obviously, the theory around them. You can know that the this kind of transformation assumes and approximates the shape of Earth as an ellipsoid or a sphere in general in some cases, but you actually gonna just forget all this theoretical detail about cartography and stick with Raster your web implementation that let you transform easy. In uh, this uh, projection, which is actually a map, a uh, project, a project mapping because it tried to map basically the geographical information spanned around the solid, which is our earth, to a flat surface, which is our monitor, obviously. 
try to understand and basically transform the, the same image in a different coordinate system. Okay, a coordinate system that a computer is able to understand. Because a computer, or in general, the most used frameworks, things like LeafLight.js or OpenStreetMap, uh, not OpenStreetMap, OpenLayer.js, are not able to understand any kind of CRS different from this one. This one is basically the classic one, which one the, we know, latitude, longitude, and altitude, do something quite this slightly different. And Rasterio offers you basically the same, uh, the same idea. E, what else? Well, this is basically the same. I know you obviously use the volume itself we saw earlier in the vector data part to show the data, and you see basically that converting them to the right CRS you got by an image that is capable of showing up on the on the yeah on the image itself on the image itself. Okay, this concludes basically the parts about raster. So we see in the first part vector data, discrete source, geometry, and a set of attributes, in this case raster, which is basically continuous source of data. Okay. Nothing complicated until now. Okay, we start playing with something which my much more interesting, at least my opinion, because we play with earth observation data. Earth observation data comes from uh, data which are acquired by satellites itself. So we got a wonderful plethora of satellites around the Earth itself that serve from different tasks, from weather forecast to analyze the atmosphere, concentrate on the atmosphere itself. And we end, up, we end up basically acquiring a lot of really interesting data that somehow should be interpreted or somehow should be uh, processed in order to get some sort of knowledge. Okay, it's pretty interesting because uh, the satellite of the um, Sentinel project, which is a project of the European Space Agency, our European Space Agency, are for free. So you can run your own business based on free images. So it's pretty cool, in my personal opinion, because there are lots of companies that make money, real money, using and extracting some sort of knowledge on these free images. In particular, in this case, we're going to see the most classical example called NDVI, where NDVI stands for Normalized Differential Vegetation Index, which is basically an index capable of highlighting details about the vegetation. Okay, So we're going to run this index in order to have a grasp of the composition of the soil or composition of the part of the earth that are basically snapshotted by the satellite itself, which is in this case Sentinel-2. The name of the satellite is called Sentinel-2. I invite you to have a look at this kind of sources. The formula of satellite of the NDVI is this one, while the NWDI is basically the same as the first one, but for water, okay? So NVDI stands for natural Normalized Vegetation Differential Index, while the second one is Normalized Water Vegetation Index. Uh, as we see, as we saw earlier, basically we're gonna play with raster EO. Since we're gonna play with raster, I make you notice that the image is pretty different. We are not talking about GeoTIFF, we are talking about JP2. JP2 stands for JPEG 2000. It's basically a proprietary format, I think, for Hexagon. And it's pretty interesting because you try to compress all data. The image we're gonna play with are basically um, have a dimension of I think 10,000 per 10,000, so uh, they are pretty big images. And so we're gonna try to concentrate all the image in a solo in a, a really short format, okay? And for this reason, there is this format that stands exactly for uh, this kind of task. So you load basically the image itself, as you see. As you probably see, this zero means that you have one band, because Sentinel-2 is a multi-spectral multi sensor, so it basically acquires multiple photos in multiple bands. So instead of having just an image that is composed by different channels, you got different images, one for different channels. It's actually the same. Okay, you read it, you compute the NDVI, you compute the one, you check the you check the value just to be sure that basically the calculus is correct, that the index are, are range from minus one to one, and you get up with this kind of image, which is pretty real. Eh? The southern part of Italy, Apulia, Gargano, you know. And you notice that basically this, the NVDI, is able to highlight where is water and where is vegetation. So you basically see that the area with the water are pretty white, or at least really lighter. While on the other case, the vegetation index has a really 
green contract. So obviously you can change the, your chain map, your basically your color map, so you can span, you can make the image spanning from the red to orange to red to orange to yellow, something else. But the basic idea is you use this index to highlight something, which is in the case is the vegetation itself. Okay, like in this case, you highlight basically the concentration of water. So you basically have the white, which span basically all the vegetation and all the soil. And you have this darker, this darker here is probably some, I don't know, some holes here, which is pretty common that is water itself, or vortex over there, which represents the amount of water that is over here. You can obviously run any kind of custom classification. This comes from the fact that the particular material which have been fired from the satellites itself reflects an amount of energy that is different based on material itself. So you basically end up defining your own custom index and able to extract or trying to deduce a particular kind of material itself. So you find this kind of, for example, these are mine, eh? these are no stand for the letter, sure, you can find everything else. And you say basically you build up a table when you encounter this condition, you can define this vegetation is water is soil. It's pretty, really pretty easy classification. It is a pixel based classification because you run this classification for each pixel, which actually could not work because it does not fill all the context of itself, which can be complex at the same time. But it works pretty well because it gives you a basically about an idea of how the the image itself has been composed. You see that basically there are lots of blue, which is the sea, there are the red, the green, which are the soil and the vegetation itself. Okay, so you can end up with playing this kind of analytics or this kind of images to get you a grasp about the photo or about the satellite imagery you're working with. And obviously you could just uh, uh, combine raster data and vector data in order, for example, to develop some sort of deep learning based algorithm because you can use the vector data to basically label the areas of the raster data which correspond to a particular label. So like in this case, which is the, which indicates the current level, current level stands for particular kind of vegetation, kind of culture, okay? where you can have basically this one, which is a label. I don't know, probably it's uh, rose, olive oil, I don't know, something like this. And you have an area, which is in this case a polygon. So you end up basically mixing all together, okay, the raster data and the polygon data, and you end up with the pixel values for a particular colony level. And using this kind of information, you basically build up a data set that you can exploit later to developing some sort of machine learning based algorithm, or at least, like we say in the earlier uh, deep learning based uh, approach. In images, typically convolution network are used. And so this is one, so this is real, uh, this is real. Okay, next part. The main problem with playing, or at least my personal opinion with this kind of data is that basically when we start playing with big data itself, Python, comes to be, not in my personal opinion, pretty well fitted to solve with this kind of, this kind of data. In particular, there is a framework which you probably know, which is about Spark, which has been developed in Scala, so it offers API basically in, Spa, in uh, Scala. But since as a Python community, we feel the necessity to play with Python itself, Scala team in particular, the uh, a team of the original two, which is called GeoTrellis, has developed some binding, which is called GeoPySpark. GeoPySpark basically lets you to play with Apache Spark, Python, working with big rasters, okay? Working with, uh, in general, big rasters coming from satellite imagery itself. So after defining the context itself, creating the Spark context, based on how much memory you have, how much worker you have, because Spark is basically a distributed architecture that let you spawn computation over multiple servers if you have one. You basically end up loading image in the same way, and you start playing with API that are basically pretty simple with Geo by Spark. That let you understand how the extent of the image itself, the shape of the image, and obviously understand the CRS. The CRS stands for basically the way latitude, altitude, the longitude should be interpreted with. Obviously, as you probably know, instead of getting up 
or saying to the workers of Apache Spark, the entire image itself, so instead of transferring, for, I don't know, Sentinel-1, for example, makes images of four gigas. So instead of passing to the worker four gigas of data, you start tiling the image, which is basically, you got, an you got an image, and you get up basically dividing the images in pieces, okay? You start passing to the worker one piece, and run parallel computation over each piece, trying to get and collect all the results all together. So you basically are able to make the things parallel and probably reduce the factor by time n. Obviously, this doesn't work when you need to compute when the computation function is not stateless. So it depends on the particular result that's coming from, for example, another function. Okay, But in general, this should be possible, at least for a particular kind of procedures. So we basically define this procedure, which take an image, it basically contains in lot tiles the image itself getting tiles. So in this way, we put an image, we split in 60 by 60 tiles. We create the metadata. So we create a series of metadata which have been useful to be understood by classic QGIS program or in general GIS program capable of handling this kind of image. And we created basically the data structure of GeoPySpark, which is called Tiled Raster Layer, which is in this case is spatial. Spatial is not the sole one type of layer that could be created with GeoPySpark because you get, for example, a time series analysis of multiple image satellite, and in that case, you have another variable, which is the time, okay? So you can just use this time variable to try to map this temporal series, temporal series of geospatial imagery. You can end up with layer metadata seeing this one. In particular, I make you notice that basically we got up with different keys that span from 0 to 59, 59, which is exactly 60 by 60 code tiles. And we define Instagram. Um, from Instagram, we define how values are distributed over the image itself. Over the image itself, and we create basically a color ramp, starting from the gray, using this histogram. I can, you can obviously, when you tile, when you process them, you stitch all together again to get a sole image that you're gonna save on your particular disk. Okay, it's pretty simple. Um, what else? Oh, you basically. Uh, have this one, this layer DD, and they will make you notice that uh, uh, Spark is probably not the best to use with Python because in general, when you see Spark, you need to pay the cost of transferring data between Python and Apache Spark structure. Okay, so this passing of when your data becomes quite relevant can be pretty impressive and relevant itself. And so you need to optimize something to understand how much data you need to pass from one another. So in general, obviously, even if there is a library in GeoPaySpark which contain bindings for GeoTrellis itself, I usually play with Scala and this framework, which is pretty good, works well, because actually, the GeoTrellis framework, which is the original one, offer a lot of much more wonderful and useful APIs than Python itself. Obviously, you end up playing with PNG, so it's pretty easy. So PNG doesn't contain any kind of geographic information. And you apply cropping area, so basically you have a polygon, you cut the image, the satellite imagery based on the polygon itself. You extract, for example, the first band, because we play with two different it with two different images, so you end up with a matrix composed by two different matrix basically stuck together. So you extract the first band. We create basically the PNG. We create you can create the GeoTIFF image, and you can write things like this, which are pretty interesting in my personal opinion because they are basically, as Spark suggests, they are lazy. So basically, computation is called when you call the safe stitched method. So you basically convert the layer type to a float 32 number. You apply some sort of function that is able to combine the values coming from different cell, different layers, and then you save the image itself stitched. So all together. In a particular on a particular folder. The things that I like of Sparky that is the laziness itself, the computation happens just at the end. So when you start collecting the data itself and not in the beginning, not the not in the middle of the operation. Okay, we miss just two things. How can we download data? You basically I say that MESA uh, data can be freely available. So you basically end up playing with Sentinel-1 data, which is rather imagery. 
or Sentinel-2 imagery, and you obviously have a lots of wonderful Python and simple Python libraries to play with these kind of tools. We, in particular, the one is called sentinel Soft that let you, I don't know, search on the catalog itself, the all the frames that overlap or intersect the, the area of interest, and you download it based on different kind of parameters that you can set, as you'll see, the orbit direction, ascending, descending, and so on. And you can have another system which called Copernicus data that contains a lot of pre-processed image. Image that contain, I don't know, the amount of oxygen or carbon dioxide in the Adriatic Sea are basically freely available in the Copernicus data set. Uh, but you just need to apply for getting a free free access. The access is free, but you need to you need basically to apply. Another format of compress in uh, which comes from Copernicus data is the NetCDF which basically is basically the same. You get some geographical features over here. And for each point, you get some value. OK. In this particular case, you have basically a, the upper, upwelling phenomenon of the Baltic Sea. So you get a, a lot of really interesting, uh, differentiated kind of example that you can use to build up your own products. And the, all these images are free, are free. And you can run business. On the contrary, there are some sort of imagery coming from local state, local uh, local institutions, such as the ASI, which stands for Agency of Special of Italia, which has its own satellites, but the images are not free to use. So this is actually a problem for certain kind of cases. Okay, first one, last one, last one is Apache Snap. Uh, is uh, sorry, is about Tesla Snap. Tesla Snap is basically a tool that is able to that is able to process data coming from Sentinel constellation Miley. And this in particular sample that you won't be able to run using my Docker image because you miss the Sentinel-1 imagery data, so you'll miss the source data. It's basically a pipeline of operation that try to auto-rectify the image itself acquired by the satellite. Auto-rectifying image means basically correcting errors typically done by snapshotting a photograph from a really high space. Nothing complex. But also in this case, you need to apply some sort of these kind of operators and try to split the image itself to extract the, just the data you need to the burst to extract just the pieces of the piece you actually extract earlier and apply finally the terrain correction. This probably is interesting, but probably when you will run, if you will run, obviously, using the another Docker image I pointed in the readme file. This will go probably in out of memory space because it's a snap is a Java based virtual it's a Java based application and it offers Python bindings for handling this kind of problem, but it requires a lot of computational power. And uh, so it'll probably go with auto space. In general, if the problem if we go with the auto space you need to reduce the amount of data you're gonna process with. So you basically need to crop the image itself because processing. But the uh, the idea is at least the same. As you probably know, you have basically this object here, which is a Nash map, which is pretty typical from the Java world. But you need to use this one to compute a calculate or let's say write the code for running this kind of pipeline, which is basically composed by different uh, pieces where you have basically an output product, which is in this case the calibrated data, which is the input to the next step. It's basically a pipeline. This is not lazy. So this is basically each point, each part of the step will be executed. And I warn you that we're gonna use some spaces because each, pro each product, each intermediate product will be written on the disk itself. Okay, but anyway, as a snap is quite complex sub program, it has a desktop interface, so you can start playing with desktop interface and then probably if you wanna optimize it, playing with the Python part of the version itself. And the end you got in the Docker itself, in the image itself, you got the result of this kind of image. So let's wrap it up. I know I just went to much fast, but it was a training material, not at all. So we see vectors as a discrete geospatial source, nothing complex. You got a feature characterized by a geometry, and for each geometry, you got a set of attributes. And you got rasters, which is basically a matrix. And you, when you see a color, you color image, basically you have different kind of metrics that are stuck together and it show one for each channel. 
we play with Earth Observation Data, in particular we play with NDVI and DWI, with Sentinel-2 imagery. We play, or at least playing with GeoPySpark processing pipelines. We see how to play with ASA Snap and in particular running Python into ASA Snap or using ASA Snap and Copernicus data, which is the phenomenal of Wally. We'll miss a lot of things, obviously, in this training, also in this training. We didn't talk about anything about geographical database Python bindings. You probably know there is a passages, which is a pretty known extension of Postgres to handle geographical data, so you basically can run geographical queries directly on your database. Your database get back the points that intersect, and I don't know, for example, a buffer of a circle around a particular center. But Postgres is not the sole one. There is Elasticsearch, there is Accumulo, there is, I don't know, MongoDB. We didn't play with WMS, WFS, which is basically the main protocol based on HTTP to retrieve the data, geographical data, show them on a web interface. We didn't talk about big vectors, so we didn't talk about a lot of vector data. They typically use vector tiles, some concept about vector tiles. There is a fantastic image I invite you to show, I invite you to see, which is basically the taxi trips in New York, which is being based on the vector tiles, and the result is really remarkable in my opinion. And we didn't see how can we use GeoPySpark to ingest raster data and build up a TMS server, so basically a web server capable of showing all the ingested data. But that's up. I'll give you a grasp. This is just a grasp. You're welcome. No, thank you very much. Any question? None? OK. Uh, Rethink was confused. Oh, yeah, sure. Go find here. Or maybe also in the PyCon page of the talk. Uh, actually, they're not as lights. They are all notebooks. So you got a um, repository over here over GitHub. You can, can put the, the link in the, the description. Oh, OK. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. OK. No more questions? Thank you very much. Uh, again, Francesco. <laughs>